That was a beautiful anthem. Thank you. I, um, some years ago, we were having a, uh, a focus on the Holy Spirit here. We did a time, a focus on the Holy Spirit. One of the things we invited our leaders to do was to fast during this time. Actually, it was right after Easter leading to Pentecost. And it wasn't a, it's, it's not a um, practice that many of us had done a lot of. And uh, Dr. Billy Abraham uh, came and visited with us about it, about fasting and about the Holy Spirit. He's a, at that time a professor at Perkins. Um, and he, um, he talked about that particular verse, that fasting is to give you the sensation of longing, of hungering for something, and to recognize that there is a spiritual hunger that should be like that physical hunger, longing for the Holy Spirit, for God to fill, like a, like a deer is panting for, for something that we are panting for God to come into our hearts and lives. So every time I hear uh, that verse, I think of that, and it might be appropriate for some of you during the Lenten season. Let's pray together. Oh God, open us up. Open our eyes that we might see and our ears that we might hear. Open our hearts that we might feel. And then, O oh Lord, open our hands that we might serve. Amen. In the year 2009, February of 2009, a man came into my office, came to visit me. He was a person I knew from a former church. I knew him pretty well, actually. And he um, had called and said he really needed to see me that day. And so uh, she made it, my assistant, Juliet, made a time for him to come. And um, when he came in my office, he was a mess. And he said, I, it, it turns out that he, he was an independent oil and gas man. He had um, about 50 employees. And the price of oil had fallen from like $130 to like $35. And he said, we, we're bankrupt. And I've had to let everybody go. I've had to let my entire, everybody's gone. Business is closed down. Um, I owe a bunch of money. Uh, I've had to tell my family that we can't live the life we used to live. And he said, I don't, I don't know how I got us here. But uh, he said, I guess I'm just, I'm just such a loser. It feels like I'm just such a loser. Now, I, I, part of me wanted to say to him, and, and what felt sort of like my job was to say to him, no, you're not. You're not. But what I realized was at that moment that maybe God had him where he wanted him. Right? We're proud people. All of us are proud. We want to be self-sufficient. We want to stand on our own feet. We want to feel like we have it together. We're talking right now about character, right? And we think of character, we think of somebody with character as somebody who's wise and makes the right decisions, does the right thing all the time. And no matter what, they have this inner character that always does the right thing. And what, what humility tells us is that nobody always does the right thing. And that part of our job is to recognize our fallenness. To recognize that indeed, it's what we do during the Lenten season particularly, is we recognize that we sin, that we do make mistakes, that we do fall short. If you've never had that moment where you feel like it's all falling around you, like you must be a terrible parent because your kids have, are, just have gone off the edge. Or you, I must be a terrible husband or wife because I can't make a marriage work. Or I, I, I must be a terrible employee because I just got fired. Or I must be terrible with money because I'm, I'm going to have to file for personal bankruptcy. I've obviously spent, lived beyond my means. Or I must be a terrible leader because look what I've led this organization to. If you've never had that experience, then maybe you've never gotten to the point where you feel like, God, you're all I have left. Yeah, I've got to depend on you and your love. 
You see, humility is built into the Christian walk. It's who we're called to be. To be, to, to be in that place where we have that realization of our total dependence upon God. So uh, the scripture we've chosen today is called, is I think one of the most powerful in all of the New Testament. It is, um, it is called the verses 6 through 11, which is if you look in your Bible, it's in verse. It's a hymn that was sung in the early church. The scholars refer to it as the canonic hymn. Uh, the word kenosis in Greek is the word that means empty, to empty. And verse 7 here says that Jesus emptied himself. Uh, it con- it's, it's a beautiful contrast. He said he did not count equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself. So it's between taking and giving is the picture. And and what I want us to talk about today is that is is the verses that lead up to that, what we the preamble in Scripture to the Canonic Hymn, because it teaches us that we are to be like the Jesus who empties Himself. Well, let's uh, look at the verses together. You can keep your hymnal, in, I mean your Bible, in front of you, and um, we can look through it or or your Scripture uh, from the bulletin. So he begins. Uh, do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit. So the first thing I would say is he tells us to beware of any time we do anything that says, what about me? What about me? What about us? We live in a what about me, what about us world, right? We have this sense of, okay, I'm going to claim it. I've got to own it. It's mine. I've got to fight for it, by golly. And this sense of, you know, um, what about me? We, we often find ourselves in that place. I, th- I think poor James and John, you know, uh, Jesus had been teaching for three years. He's on his way to the cross. He's on this journey, like literally he's told his disciples, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to die there. I'm going to give myself away completely. And he said, everyone, we, we are called to serve. No, no one is, no servant is above his master. And he's the master. He's, he's demonstrating that we're called, called to be servants. He's going to come wash some feet. And just before he gets to Jerusalem, James and John come up on him and say, hey, Jesus, when we get to heaven, can I sit at your right hand and, and him at your left hand? He's got to be going, oh, God, like, where have you, have you guys been with me for three years? Do you get this? Because it's so built into us. I was a, a debater in high school, and so I still uh, kind of follow some things going on in the speech and debate world, the National Forensic League. And so their debate topic, every year they have sort of two debate topics. One's the regular high school debate topic, and another one is what they call the big idea topic. And the big idea topic in 2018-19 was this. Resolved, Humans are primarily driven by self-interest. True or false? So you'd have to argue the affirmative, yes, humans are driven by self-interest primarily, or the negative, no, I don't believe that to be the case. Let's do a vote here. How many of you believe humans are driven primarily by self-interest? You would argue the affirmative. (laughs) How many of you would argue the negative? We got any negatives? All right, there's some optimistic people back there, one or two. Go for that's a uh, that's right. I don't know whether I don't know what humans are primarily driven by. But what the scripture teaches us is that the, that in the kingdom of God, everything's upside down. That those who are last are first. Those who are first end up last. That um, that if you want to be greatest, you must be the least. That if uh, that God lifts up the lowly and brings down the haughty. So you know maybe it is actually self-interest, because the picture we get in Scripture is that those who are last will be made first, that the lowly will be brought up that Jesus gave himself away and because of that was lifted up that he might sit at the right hand of God. So that someday perhaps 
We give ourselves away. We live that humble life, and God lifts us up. Uh, I used to sing, we used to sing in youth ministry a song that would go, Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. It's based on James 4.10. It's humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, and God will lift you up. So the first thing is we do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Then he goes on, he says, but... The opposite is, in humility, regard others as better than yourselves. So we look, look up then to others. Now here's the truth. All of us have people we look up to, right? You have people you look up to. But I'll bet you there are people you look down on to. It doesn't say look up to some others. It says we look up to others. We, we look up. Uh, it, that's a hard thing for us because we're so prone to make judgments about all the people around us, right? We are to check them out, make a decision, decide whether we're going to look up to them or whether we're going to look down on them. Many years ago when I was in youth ministry, we uh, took a trip to Reynosa, Mexico with a group of youth. Uh, I think some of you in here might have been on that trip with me when you were youngsters. So um, we went to, Re to uh, Reynosa, and we worked out of a church there called El Buen Pastor, the Good Shepherd United Methodist Church. Uh, Methodist Church. Uh, it's the, you know, the Methodist Church of Mexico. And um, the pastor there was a man named Pastor Raul. And they had seven little satellite churches all around in the colonias uh, around there that they um, helped to support, that they really sponsored. And there's the church, El Buen Pastor, only had like 150 people in it. And I was just so humbled that, I mean, so amazed that they had these, these other satellite churches. And we were working in one of the uh, colonias called Los Cumbres, which means the heights, no running water, tar paper shacks, no sewage. No, I mean, it was, it, was a, um, it was a really poor area. But they had a little satellite church there. So I'm talking to Pastor Raul, and I said, Pastor Raul, I'm just, I just am amazed at this work you're doing out here, the way you're helping these people, and it just makes such an incredible difference. And he said, well, it's, the, it's my favorite thing to do, is to, is to work in the colonias. He said, um, I learned so much there. And he said, the people in the colonias and our, in our little satellite churches, they are, they, I have learned about joy from them. I've learned about their resilience. I've learned just what it's like to be completely dependent on God, just to really have to count on God for everything and how strong their faith is. I was just, I thought, that is just, I was, I, I, I was really humbled by Pastor Raul because I would have said, isn't it great the good things we're doing for people? Isn't it great for us to go help? We're doing what Jesus wanted us to do, to go help people. But that wasn't his picture. It was like, they're helping me. I get to, I look up to these folks. For, uh, I don't believe, I don't agree with everything Ralph Waldo Emerson said, most, mostly his focus on us not being social beings, that we should guide everything, you know, all of it's about our own decisions and our own conscience. But one thing he said I loved, he said, in my walks, every man is my superior because I can learn from him. Every place I go, every person I meet, I can learn something from if, if we'll just get our heads in that place, that instead of evaluating and looking down, we choose to see everyone and say, I'm going to look up to you. What can I learn from you? Maybe even from the mistakes you've made. All right. So in humility, regard others as better than yourselves. Look up to others. And then he says, let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. So you look up to others, but you look out for others. You look out for their interests, for their, their lives. Uh, here's my favorite definition of humility. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking of yourself less. Maybe you've heard that before. I think that's so great. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's becoming self-effacing. Make yourself thinner, less significant. Uh, worry about yourself less. 
uh, when I was on the board in North Carolina at Duke, uh, at, at the seminary there, I would fly back to uh, Houston. And in those days, you had to fly through Charlotte to get to Houston. There was no direct flight from Raleigh-Durham to Houston. And so one day I'm sitting in the lounge uh, at a late afternoon flight, waiting for a late afternoon flight to Charlotte, and there's a lady on the phone there, an older lady on the phone, very upset. And she's talking to someone on the other end of the line, and she, ha- uh, her flight, the flight ahead of her has been canceled. The one that she, the flight to Charlotte ahead of her, and she said, I'm on standby at this, on this flight. Um, I don't know if I'm going to get in or not. And she, she turns out, you could hear she was going to miss her sister's funeral in in uh, wherever the, I don't know where her connecting flight was going, but she had to get to Charlotte so she could get to that next place. And she was so upset. And she said, I'm on standby. I don't know if I'm going to make it. And so she, she hung up the phone. And there was a young, all of us, can, it, it was a, a crowded um, departure lounge, and everyone there could hear her talking. And this young man gets up, and he goes over to her and begins talking quietly to to comfort her. And I thought, that's so nice of him. And then he takes her by the arm and they walk up to the little counter there. And there's a conversation that happens there. And then he takes his little roller bag and he leaves. He gave her a seat. And I, it was the last flight of the day. And I thought to myself, I didn't do that. It had crossed my mind, but I didn't do it. And I think all of us in that place were humbled by this young man. To actually look out for this. See, it, 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 you know, it sounds, it sounds good. Yeah, I'm going to look out for the interest of others. But when it comes, really, really comes down to it, do we do that? Do we think of others and their needs before our own? Usually not. But it is the Christian, isn't that the essence of Christian love? I mean, isn't that the story? Isn't that what the gospel's about? Isn't that what Jesus did for us? Right? Greater love has no one than to lay down his life for the friend. Isn't that what the cross is? That every Sunday we come in and look at this cross, and what it reminds us of is that Jesus, the one we say we're going to live and love like, has chosen to give his life away for me, for my interests, not for his. See, that's humility. That's focusing not on getting my needs met, getting what I want, but on what others' needs are. And it, 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 it's one of those things that um, sounds really good until we have to make those sacrifices ourselves. So he doesn't stop there. H- how are we going to do that if, if, if all of us raised our hands and said, we're primarily driven by self-interest, that's, that's how most humans, me included, you included, or if that's how we're, we're, we are, how are we going to get past that? Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. So we look up to, other, to others, we look out for others, we look in for the mind of Christ. We look into our own hearts and our own minds for the mind of Christ. That's what's inside us. St. Paul says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Christ will take over my heart, my life, and that will be what drives me. Not human uh, um, interest, but the Christ within me. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of, literally my favorite illustration from him, is he said that there are only two temptations in Scripture. One is the temptation to Adam and Eve, um, and they succumbed to that temptation. The other temptation is to Jesus, and he resisted it. So he said, so when temptation knocks on my door, I send Jesus to answer it. I, I, I send the Christ in my heart to answer the door because that Christ in me is what makes the difference. You, we have to be rooted in our, our belovedness 
of Christ. We have to be rooted in the realization that just as we are, broken as we are, bankrupt, spiritually, morally, whatever, as we are, that we are beloved by Christ. That just as the heavens open up and, and, the, and um, God says over Jesus, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased, the heavens open up over us and says, this is my beloved child with whom I am well pleased. I love him. I love her. When we get rooted in our value there, not in our value because we've been great providers or great parents or great husbands or great wives or whatever it is that we think is important. When we get rooted in our value in Christ, then we can live as Jesus taught us to live. I've, liked, I've always liked this illustration. If, I have a, if, I, if I'm in the water and I want to lift someone else up, and I try to lift them up and, and my feet can't touch the bottom, I can't lift them up. When I try and lift them up, all that happens is I go down. And in fact, if I'm flailing about, I'm probably pushing them down so I can get up. But if my feet are firmly planted on Christ, in the rock of Christ, on the bottom, then I, then I can think of myself less. I don't need to worry about myself. I don't need to build myself up. I don't need to tell myself, you're great, Tom. You sure are wonderful. I don't need to, to, I don't need to do um, self-affirmations in the mirror because I know I'm loved by Christ and I can lift others up because I'm so firmly rooted. The mind of Christ inside us. All right, so how do we do this? What is, the, what is the, the habits? Well, that's what all of our habits are about, is to develop that mind of Christ in us. That's why we pray and worship. That's why we study the Bible. That's why we make friends. That's why we tell our stories. That's why we give ourselves away. I, I've been, uh, I kind of let my physical fitness go beginning in, at Halloween, and it lasted all the way through the Halloween candy, which is still laying around some places, you know, and the Thanksgiving and Christmas, you people bring desserts and stuff all the time. It's not good for us. Please continue. And, <laughs> and, uh, and so finally, recently, I said, it's time. It's time. You got to get it back together. My doctor said, it's time, Tom. So, so I've been working on my core strength, and one of the, one of the exercises is called dead bugs. Do you know the dead bugs exercise? So you lie on your back, and you, um, I tried to get, um, well, one of you choir members want to come and do this? <laughs> so you lie on your back, and you put your arms up and your legs up, and then one, leg go, one arm goes down and one leg goes down, the opposite ones, and then you go this way, and then you go this way with your lying on your back like that. And uh, so you look like a cockroach that's flailing away. That's, that's the thinking of it. You look like a cockroach. I don't know why they call it dead bugs, because the, they just, dead bugs just lay there, right? This would, it should be dying bugs, but it's not dying bugs. Anyway, you're working on your core strength. So what are the, what are the exercises we have to do to work on our spiritual core strength? We serve. We serve. That's what Jesus did. Though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. We strengthen our core by giving ourselves away in generosity and service. We find some way to serve. You know that guy who came to see me in 2009? At the end of our conversation, he said, you know, I've, I haven't been active in our local church where he was, where he'd been, where I'd met him. Is there anything I can do around here? It's like, and I'm going to tell you, that is so common. When someone comes with a, a, a problem, they're also looking for a place that they can lean in, that they can serve in some way. Because intuitively, we know that that is what connects us to the mind of Christ, that we choose to practice as he practiced. We give ourselves away. Let's pray together. Gracious and loving God, we know that we're not perfect. We've fallen short. But sometimes we try to be so proud, so sure that we have the answers, so sure that we have the right opinions, so sure that 
we are doing the right thing all the time, but you remind us, no, that's not it. We're fallen. So we, ad- we admit our sin before you. Like the tax collector in the temple, O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Help us to hear your voice reminding us that we're beloved so that our, f- our feet will be planted firmly enough in you that we can lift others up. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen.